Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start of my review of Them, Adventures with Extremists by John Ronson. So, it doesn't actually have a blurb, but there is a bunch of, like, questions, I guess, here at the front that this book sets out to answer. Uh, it is a non-fiction book as well. Uh, I've also previously read his The Psychopath Test, and there's, um, yeah, he's written a few other books more recently as well. Is there really a secret room from which a tiny elite rules the world, and if so, can it be found? Them, Adventures with Extremists, is a romp into the heart of darkness involving 12-foot lizard men, PR savvy Ku Klux Klansmen, Ian Paisley, Hollywood limousines, kidnapped sex slaves, David Icke, and Nikolai Soskou's shoes. While John Ronson attempts to locate the secret room, he is chased by men in dark glasses, unmasked as a Jew at a jihad training camp, and witnesses CEOs and leading politicians undertake a bizarre owl ritual in the forests of Northern California. He also learns some alarming things about the looking glass world of them and us. Are the extremists right, or has he become one of them? So I'm going to go through and look at some of my flags here. Um, this is what happened when there's a Muslim extremist trying to raise money for extremist groups. It says, Omar Bakri was unlike my image of a Muslim extremist. Then he told me he had a good idea. Just watch this, he said. He turned the leaflets upside down. Help the orphans, he yelled. Help the orphans. Omar, I exclaimed, scandalized. The passers-by started to accept his leaflets. This is good, chuckled Omar. This is good. You see, if I wasn't a Muslim, I'd be working for, how you say, Saatchi and Saatchi. And there are a couple of bits here that I want to want to read out. So, um, Omar can't go into Soho, so um, um, Ronson's giving him a lift. So I drove Omar into town by a route that avoided Soho. We passed a poster advertising the Spice Girls' debut album. Such a very stupid thing, mumbled Omar. Spicy Girls. What will become of the Spice Girls when Britain is transformed into an Islamic nation, I asked. They will be arrested immediately, he replied. They will not even be existing in an Islamic state. Okay, we can go on. Turn right at the lights. And then this was interesting too. It says, um, Omar says, The Quran rules every aspect of my life. It tells me how I eat, how I sleep, how I fight, and even how I will die. Omar paused. You know, he said, the Quran even, the Quran even tells me which direction I must break wind in. There was a short silence. And which direction do you break wind in? I asked. In the direction of the non-believer, Omar, Omar said. Ha ha ha, the direction of the non-believer. So here we have this moment when he um, meets this meets this extremist. Uh, it says, Anjum disappeared and I was left standing guard over thousands of pounds, money that would go to Hamas to kill the Jews in Israel. For a while I stood there. And what the hell was I doing, guarding money that would be used to kill the Jews? And then I understood that I had to take the money. I had to reach into the car, grab the Coca-Cola bottles and make a run for it. This was my responsibility, my duty. I had an obligation to do this. I had the strength to carry two bottles. How many lives might that save? Omar and Anjan were still inside. The car was unlocked. But I didn't do it, of course. I just stood there. And then Anjan and Omar returned, thanked me for my help, and took the money to the bank. To be fair, you do have to be impartial when you're a journalist, you know? So there was this pretty interesting stuff here about David Icke. And this is also with, um, uh, what's his name? All right, well, anyway. David Icke, yelled Alex, suddenly, is a turd in a punch bowl. What do you mean? He talks about the global elite, the Bilderberg group, these power structures which are all real, all true, meat and potatoes, something you can bite into. And then at the end of this he says, by the way, they're all blood drinking lizards. Really? Al Gore needs blood to drink. So does Prince Philip. He's discrediting the whole thing. You've got a nice fruit punch. Ike takes a great big dump right into the middle of it, and now nobody's going to drink out of that punch bowl. That's his job and he's doing it well. Are you suggesting that David Icke is in league with the global elite, I said, employed to make the whole thing seem ridiculous? He's either a smart opportunist con man, said Alex, or he's totally insane, or he's working for them directly. I thought this little bit of dialogue here was um, pretty interesting. So what's this all about, asked the new guy. Well, I whispered, that big old man in the trilby has tracked down the tiny group of people who rule the world in secret. Anyway, the two of us are going to Portugal next week to confront them. Oh, right, he said. He seemed unimpressed. What do they do, these secret rulers of the world? I shrugged. Everything, I guess, I said. They're called the Bilderberg Group. Can't say I've heard of them, he said. Jim's dedicated his life to exposing them, I said. It's not so surprising that I've never heard of them, said the new guy. He scanned the room. Every barstool was occupied this afternoon. Retired newsmen in suits stared into their beer glasses. The men's bar seemed to be where the Washington press corps went when there were no more deadlines, no stories left to file. It's not so, it's not so surprising, he said. Pretty much everyone here has dedicated their life to something or other that nobody's ever heard of. I like the response that Ronson has here as well, because this is the kind of thing I can imagine I would say. 
Uh, it struck me that we all seemed to be wandering aimlessly in some kind of unison, but it didn't cross my mind, right up until the moment that the man in the tweed jacket marched across the room and began questioning me in an angry whisper that I was being tailed. We've watched you for an hour. I'm the hotel manager. You take pictures. You ask questions about some big important meeting. Who are you? I... I paused. Then I clumsily announced, I'm from England. It was the only thing I could think of. This works, of course, in other circumstances abroad, but it didn't work here. This bit here about uh, Henry Kissinger. And there was Henry Kissinger, possibly the most powerful individual the post-war world has known. Dr. Kissinger, who sanctioned the secret bombing of Cambodia and later won the Nobel Peace Prize, who revealed to the press his heart attack with the words, well, at least that proves I have a heart. And here he was trundling up the drive of the Caesar Park in the back of an old Mercedes. This bit was quite interesting too. Um, Who are these people, said Fred. Why does nobody want to know? They're the masters of the universe, said Jim. The rulers of the world. You know their names now. There was Conrad Black, the world's third biggest media magnate, the owner of the Daily Telegraph and the Jerusalem Post and the Chicago Sun-Times and 40 Canadian dailies and 447 other newspapers around the world. Conrad, Bla Conrad Black, who, when asked what epitaph he would like, replied, Just my name and dates. The more exalted a person, the less is written on their tombstone. Charles de Gaulle has just his name and dates. Winston Churchill has the same. Otto von Bismarck has only his last name. And Napoleon Bonaparte has only the letter N with no dates at all. This was a man sure of his place in history, and now I felt that perhaps I understood why. It's a crazy statistic here. Um, one out of eight Americans has hardcore anti-Semitic feelings. I was back once again inside the New York offices of the Anti-Defamation League of Nybrith, for 90 years the world's most influential monitors of anti-Semitism. This poster, part of, the ADL's ongoing publicity, part of the ADL's ongoing publicity campaign, was framed on a wall in a corridor outside Gail Ganz's office. Each time I saw it, I felt it bore testament to the ADL's tireless work. What well, they must have done to find that out. But I also wondered how the terms had been defined. What is hardcore? What are feelings? The small print offered no clues. It was just a statement of fact. This guy uh, who's in the Ku Klux Klan is talking, talking about Osama Bin Laden. He says, you got to respect that guy. It takes some dedication to live in a cave, especially if you're a multi-millionaire. And another insane statistic, it's estimated that, it has been estimated that 25% of all clansmen are undercover federal officers. 25%? Okay, I'm here with Biggie and we have the last few bits of them to talk about, don't we Biggie? I thought this was interesting because it helped to date a lot of the context of this. Um, so he's watching this video expose and it says, Richard's tape looked to be around 10th generation, which gave the video even more of a jittery and restless feel. And I just find that amusing because obviously that wouldn't be a wouldn't be a thing now. It would just be a digital file. Yeah, he sees somebody uh, who's actually the face of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, he sees him on TV, and it says, "It's Jeff." I thought, in the way you think when you see someone you know on TV, which is always amusing. The weirdest is when you see yourself on TV. Um, this I just thought was very tragic. Uh, a fortnight after we returned home, an oil tanker crashed in Yaoundé. The crash itself claimed no lives, but then people gathered to scoop up whatever oil they could. Somebody lit a cigarette and 120 people were killed. And this little exchange was quite cool. You were friends with Edi Amin and you were friends with Nikolai Sezescu, I said. You seem to have a disproportionately large number of dictator friends, if you don't mind me saying. I am also friends with Kim Il-sung, he said. Ha ha, these people are history. It doesn't matter if they are good history or bad history. I myself am not history, so I make friends with people who are. I thought this was interesting because I kind of agree with, it, agree with this. Mr. Rockefeller's conclusion was that this was a battle between rational and irrational thought. Rational people favoured globalisation, irrational people preferred nationalism. I laughed at this as well. Uh, this is really a gross analogy, said Alex, but I'll use it. I see most of these elitist individuals as a whole bunch of dog turds being laid all over this society. I don't run around stomping on them because I don't want to get it on my feet. Alex paused, his voice became sombre. I just say to the general public, let's clean these dog turds up. Let's tell these people they can't do this anymore. He also said that in all honesty, neither Bilderberg nor Bohemian Grove attract the calibre that they used to. The current members are getting older and older, and the prospective newcomers, the world leaders of tomorrow, don't seem all that interested in getting involved. Let's face it, my deep throat had said to me, this being the person who'd uh, provided some anonymous information. Nobody rules the world anymore. The markets rule the world. Maybe that's why your conspiracy theorists make up all those crazy things. Because the truth is so much more frightening. Nobody rules the world. Nobody controls anything. So yeah, all in all, I thought this was a fascinating little read and I really enjoyed it. I gave it a 4 out of 5. Definitely a John Ronson fan at this point. I've read um, two or three of his books now and I plan to read some more of his newer ones soon as well. Don't I, Biggie? Yeah, so you're going to say goodbye. 
So there we have it, that's what I thought of them by John Ronson. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit the subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon with another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.